I'm not the house of cards that falls down easily. Oh, I'm strong enough to handle what you throw at me. Welcome to Mental Health News Radio. I'm your host, Kristen Sinanta Walker. Just what are we going to discuss? The intimacy that is mental health. Let's continue to make it as comfortable as discussing brain health or heart health. This show has been on the air for several years and we have amazing co hosts. And then we created a network of podcasters on Mental Health News Radio Network.com, a place where every possible facet of mental well being can be talked about openly. My show, after several hundred interviews, the format is this intimate, deep, funny, touching, sometimes uncomfortable, but always vulnerable conversations with interesting people. The goal is to have you, our listening family, many of you who have become my good friends, feel as though you are listening in on private conversations. Thank you for tuning in and becoming part of this amazing journey with me and now with our network of podcasters. Just knowing this podcast might be helping any of you realize you are not alone on this journey called being a human being makes doing this podcast worth every second. Hello, everyone. I am here with psychologist and registered nurse, Dr. Lisa Day. Hello, Lisa. Hi, Kristen. We're going to um, do this as as a special show because we have our first responder mental health network. And we started that at, I'd say, quarter four of 2019. Who knew how important it would become in 2020? Uh, but I'm, I'm glad that we, we started it then. And I, what I really want to focus on today is um, what our mental health professionals are seeing, because they're first responders also. They maybe not looked at that way because they're not the fireman that shows up at your house or the police then that you know, that shows up at your house, but they're on the forefront of this crisis. Believe me, I don't know any mental health professionals that are not working more than they were before the coronavirus. And we're going to get into, they have their own, these are people too. They have their own anxiety and fear and whatever it is going on the same as you. And yet they still are present and here for you. So we're going to talk to Dr. Lisa Day about that today on this special show. Well, well, Kristen, I think it's just, you're absolutely spot on. I mean, these are unprecedented times and um, no one, you know, is immune from the effects, you know, of this pandemic of COVID-19. And and certainly when we think of first responders, I always think about, well, at least currently our ER docs, ER nurses, right. hospital staff, people who are transporting here in our town, we don't have ventilators. So people are transported via air or ambulance to the nearby towns, those folks, um, police officers, you know, even the, the, you know, the paramedics for other non-COVID responders. So I always think, you know, historically, I've always thought of them as being our frontline first responders. Um, but absolutely, you know, in this pandemic right now, the amount of pressure that people are experiencing from the uncertainty of this chronic threat, it really goes against, you know, our, our basic coping mechanisms. And definitely mental health providers are, are, right there at the front lines. And the, and the other thing that has been um, an added stress with that or a challenge with that for both people seeking support and for providers is literally overnight, we, you know, transformed our practices to full-time online. So, you right. know, the, you know, the first week of March, I had, you know, 36 clients that would come and sit in my office and have that interaction. And literally on, on March, I think it was 15th, I was 100% online. And, and while that has a learning curve for someone such as myself, <laughs> who's a little technologically compromised, it's as difficult for clients. And, and the other thing, and we can talk about this later, is that, you know, as this pandemic continues and as anxiety and fear um, escalates and grows and agitation and, and um, all that mobilized fight, you know, the fight, flight, or freeze comes into to space, more people are in need of mental health services, but because you're now walking into this new technology of seeing them on a screen, you know, we're exploring ways of how to make that more user-friendly, you know, right. to familiarize people with the technology. So many variables, you know, certainly, you know, with therapists and counselors on Absolutely. the front lines. Mm-hmm. And we've seen an impact with, you know, we all use Zoom, pretty much everybody use Zoom, uses Zoom on the network to do their shows. And you know, Zoom has ha- definitely had some bandwidth issues, as they would. You know, it's not a, it's not, they weren't prepared for this either. No one was. 
other technologies cropping up out there. How do we make things HIPAA compliant? Uh, if they said they were HIPAA compliant, but they haven't been challenged like they are now, you know, how are they being challenged? And and being and having to do this and not oh well we'll fix that in six months. No, you better fix it in twelve minutes, right? Because <laughs> we're in a crisis, you know. So. I love it how I was on with, uh, with Dr. Meyer uh, yesterday doing a show and he's just raving about telehealth. He just loves it. And I, I teased him on the show. I said, listen to yourself. You bashed, I'm going to grab that episode where you just bashed telehealth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and here he is, you know, 75 years old, uh, loving it, adopting it. And, and it, because hey, there is no other way. Like you have to learn this. We don't have time to go through a learning curve. You just, this is critical care. This is your first responder duty. People need help. They need to be seen. You got to learn this and people are stepping up and doing it. Well, and it's, it's interesting with that, you know, to hear um, Dr. Meyer's view on that, because I know that historically I had a handful of, of telehealth clients, you know, across the nation who had primary homes here. But my, my stance historically is that I would not start a telehealth client, that I wanted to do initial assessments with them face-to-face -face and develop a working relationship because you can get so much more in the three-dimensional space on, on body language, nonverbal communication. And yet that's been, as you said, it's, that's not an option for us anymore. People are in crises and people need help. And so it's an added dynamic for therapists of looking at how do I do a thorough assessment on my computer, computer screen? And, you know, I think that part of what's driving this is that we are in a crisis. We are scrambling to do the best we can do to meet the needs, you know, of people who are coming toward health. But we're also at the same time coming up with policy and, and assessment dynamics and, and, you know, when do you refer? And so it's, it's, it's an interesting time for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how have you, you know, amongst your colleagues, and I've been speaking with friends that are counselors in Ireland and in Italy and in Spain and in Belgium. I mean, South Africa. I mean, I've, you know, I've been on the phone with a lot of people, um, the counselors asking, you know, what's going on over there for you. So I wanted to find out from you what you're seeing in terms of the general population of mental health uh, mm -hmm. patients, what you're seeing as they come in mm -hmm. and how you're processing your own stuff while you're getting, you know, loaded with everybody else's anxiety about the very thing you have anxiety about too. Well, it, it's interesting. And I'll start with that. And then I can um, talk about the populations that are coming in. But it is interesting. I mean, you know that I've been doing this for 27 years, and I'm a pretty seasoned therapist. And, you know, the first week I thought, okay, cool. You know, I don't, I just have to be worried about from the waist up. You know, I can wear comfortable pants and <laughs> sit in my office and this will be great. And, you know, after a week of coming in really to a ghost building, I think there's probably one other person in our entire three-story building, um, and then coming in and being on the screen. And at first, the first week I really liked it, but then I realized that being on a screen and I see, you know, eight to 10 clients a day. So literally I'm, I'm clicking screen to screen to screen to screen. And, yeah. you know, as you experience that, and I'm not a Microsoft employee, I'm not used to being on the computer like that the whole time and having that um, dynamic really in your personal space because of the screen dynamic and then the level of crises. And so after the first week I came home and I thought, what in the world is wrong with me? My, I literally, my brain was just numb, um, anxiety in my chest. Um, it, and really I had to take some time to look at that. This transition to an online dynamic is completely different for how my cognitive functions yes. operate. So that was one dynamic. But then the other part is I, I currently have, so I live, um, and I have three adult children living with me, 18, 19, 22, and they're all going through their own crises as it relates to the coronavirus. I have a senior in college who's not going back to college, who's not going to have graduation, or there's a tentative date out there, but she's not finishing her senior year, and they're home all day, and when I get home, they really want to process. What are the updates? What do we know? What have you learned about the vaccination? When will we be returning to normal? And so for me as a therapist, I'm working eight to 10 clients a day, and then I transition about a 15 minute drive home, and then I go into another dynamic. Nice. And, and I don't know if other counselors are experiencing this, but then I'm the mental health counselor, right? So 
friends are calling, family members are calling, uh, my children's friends are calling, and they really do need to process. So it's really a setup, you know, for those in the mental health field, just like those in the first responding medical or emergency fields, to burn out. And so we have to be so aware of that. And hopefully we can come back and talk about that in a little bit, about some skills and self-awareness. Um, but what I'm seeing, to come back to your question about what I'm seeing in my practice, you know, I bet the majority of my clients are existing clients and probably five of the 35 that I see a week are new, new presenting clients, or that's been the average in the past two weeks. And so what I observe in existing clients is whatever the issue was that they're working on, it's gone up about... 80% in intensity. Mm. Follow me. So there, and that's, is that, you know, because of their cortisol levels going up? Is it because we're being forced to operate in a, in a manner that's, you know, not norm to the human condition, that being isolated? Right. Um, is that because of the threat, you know, the fight, flight, or freeze? Um, so part of my clients, you know, are the ones that I've worked with for some time and the intensities are higher. Certainly those who have any history of trauma, any level of PTSD and or an anxiety disorder, I'm seeing a tremendous amount of suffering, a tremendous amount of suffering. And I think that's what, you know, probably one of the reasons we're doing the show here today is because we're used to treating clients with their PTSD and their anxiety as it relates to their life and their experiences and, and how they've navigated them. And it's a whole new level when we're navigating that and we are in a trigger zone. You know, it's like bombs are dropping right outside our door. So the acuity, um, the intensity, the need um, is much higher. And you know, Kristen, I, you know, I like to think that I have some of the strongest boundaries I know in therapists, but I have to keep so in check not to try to save them. You know, so we switch back to our code, caretaking codependent tendencies of I need to make them feel right. better instead of I need to help them navigate through their triggers, their challenges and utilize healthy co coping skills. Because certainly as a therapist, if we try to fix them, oh my golly, we won't last a week. Exactly. We just won't last a week. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about that too. I mean, you know, as you're saying, you know, 80, their, their issues are heightened by 80%. Well, that means that, you know, that's happening for everybody, including the first responder mental health professionals, professionals out there, your own issues are heightened 80% too. So everybody's jumping around on some kind of hot coal. <laughs> well, and if we think about, you know, first responders and, you know, the impacted, you know, trauma or challenges, 9-11, you know, Waco, um, you know, Oklahoma bombing, all of those things have on, on therapists. One of the main predictors of that really is a therapist's history of trauma. And um, it, it's difficult to get around it. Um, but if you do have a history of trauma, you're more likely, you know, to have a stronger secondary trauma, if you will, or compassion fatigue response, uh, you know, to the current stressors. So definitely self-awareness is huge. Self, it's huge. Self-care, huge. Number one priority. It's if, if I often say, in, you know, just in the general stance that it's important to put the oxygen mask on ourselves first and then others. You've heard me talk about that. Right. But really with first responders, the most important thing that they can do is to take care of themselves first. Yeah, absolutely. Hey listeners, a quick but important notice for all the shows that we'll be doing for our first responders. In 2018, the number of police officers, firefighters, EMTs, and veterans, anyone who's considered a first responder who died of suicide was greater than the combined total killed in the line of duty. More attention is being paid, but help is often elusive. Even with more available resources, those who are first in line to help us actually asking for help for themselves, that can be the hardest thing for them to do. Mental Health News Radio Network is working with Stepstone Connect to give voice to our incredible first responders. Stepstone Connect is an organization born of the belief that accessibility and confidentiality will eliminate traditional barriers to treatment. Privacy and the peace of mind that comes with it, combined with easy, everywhere access, underlines Stepstone's mission and treatment philosophy. 
It's simple. With access to the internet and a device with a camera, you're a click away from leading mental health clinicians who specialize in the treatment of PTSD and other trauma-related injuries for first responders and their families. If you or someone you care about is struggling, please don't let another day pass before discovering what StepStone can do. Stronger connections everywhere access. StepstoneConnect.com you can find out more by going to their website, StepstoneConnect.com, or call 800-495-3761. Now back to the show. So what does that, you know, what does taking care of yourself first look like when you're a first responder? Well, I, you know, Kristen, it's not that different um, from what all of us need in general. Follow me. So if we talk about first the baselines, and then we can talk about, you know, how to increase that. You know, so for any of us, I tell people that we have cortisol intoxication. There's no way for us to get around it. Those are both providers and um, um, people who are experiencing this. All of us have it. And, you know, with cortisol, you know this, we have the fight, flight, or freeze. And so what I'm observing, both as providers and as as folks seeking therapy, is that we dance between those three. Follow me. And different people, depending upon their characters, are going to spend more time in one or the other. Mm-hmm. Fight, meaning increased agitation, irritation, aggression, um, a flight, um, anxiety, withdrawal, you know, avoidance. Freeze really is that. It's an immobilized, there's a thousand things I can do, but I can't seem to move. Um, and so, you know, when we look at the cortisol in general, the very first thing all of us want to do, and definitely first responders, is breathe. And I was um, working with someone the other day and it challenged me in a, in a way that I thought I laughed at first. And, you know, we, we talk about, you know, the importance of taking long, deep breaths. And uh, this educator said, I challenge you to take 1,000 long, deep breaths a day. And you yeah. think, you think a thousand, who has time for that? And uh, <laughs> we only need to breathe to live, but you know, that exactly. seems challenging. It does. It does. But if you think, you know, that we breathe on average 900 breaths an hour, it it makes it more feasible. It puts it in the category of sipping water. So very first and foremost, we want to make sure that when we're working with clients, when we're working with patients, that we're breathing, that we are really conscious of diaphragmatically breathing. Um, The secondary to that, or as, as important, all of us want to be, you know, yes, our doctor says exercise regularly, but with that cortisol surge and without an outlet for it to be released, such as jumping on the cougar that tries to attack your dog, right. that stuff stores. And so, you know, yes, this sounds excessive, but I, I recommend um, for everybody and definitely with those I'm um, working front lines with this, um, if, if you can, two half hour periods a day, meaning in the morning and at night, just because it's a chronic 24 hour stressor, very least 45 minutes, you know, of some rigorous any kind of aerobic activity, walking, uh, jogging, biking, hiking, swimming, if you have that luxury, Um, you know, in-home video, but, but definitely we want to exercise. But I think that, you know, when, when um, there's a several other two, but one to point out with first responders is really cognitive awareness of what our role is and what we're doing. So I find for myself in therapy, I have to be aware of my therapeutic skills of validating, helping people gain awareness and beginning to identify what they need and what is nurturing to navigate through the current challenge because we can become alarmed when we're working in crises. Yes. Um, We can become alarmed. And so we want to have cognitive awareness of what is my purpose here and am I doing that or am I getting caught, you know, into that wave, into the frenzy, into the fury? Um, Am I, am I able to leave it at the office, you know, or am I taking it home? You know, so, and, and think about this too. I, I spoke about this with Dr. Christina Hallett the other day, how, you know, she's working from home now. She's not going to an office to, I, I know, you know, in some situations and it sounds like maybe it's in yours too, where you go to your office, but you're the only one going there and you're doing mm-hmm. your, your counseling appointments that way with people at home. Is that how mm-hmm. you're doing it? Well, yes. And because of that boundary, because otherwise half my brain would be on the, what's happening in my home. Oh yeah. And I get yeah. that. But some yeah. of, some of the counselors out there don't have the ability to do that. They're not allowed to do that. So they're literally at home in the midst of what's going on at home with kids, spouse, whatever going on with home. And they're also now working at home. 
which is stressful. Oh my golly, stressful. I did one Zoom call for the state of Idaho for families and I, it was in the evening. So I chose to do it at home in my home office. And there's dogs hitting the door. There's mm-hmm. a, hey, where's the teriyaki? You know, you're just like, you know, and you, you hear all the dogs. And then in our town, everybody howls at eight o'clock in the evening. So then you hear this howling in the background. And so, you know, those are kind of funny stressors, but oh my golly, Kristen, you talk about what am I seeing in my clients? I feel that where I'm seeing the most distress are full-time working moms with kids who are at home trying to um, homeschool them or online school them and keep them occupied and deal with their, why can't I go play with Johnny? Why can't I go out in the yard? The stressors are enormous. So you put a therapist in that position and it really is over the top. Absolutely. And we get the top, you know, because we can only handle so much information about this. But I, I always think about, okay, how, it, you know, there is the trickle down of, okay, so working from home or maybe not working from home because you're out of a job, your kids are home and no money's coming in. You have to pay rent. Where do you get food? It just the amount of stress right now happening right now you know this isn't oh in two months you know we'll have to worry about food no there are people right now who literally don't know where to go how to how to get access to it their maybe their phone's going to get shut off god forbid their internet gets shut off i mean there's just those basic everyday things that are happening for a lot of a lot of people well and that very thought there is what causes people to spiral because we yes. get we, we get caught in that trail of the what ifs, what if, what if, and and not even the what ifs. We're noticing that people are being steps to try to be evicted. You know, they're they're and they don't have food. They don't have money for food. And fortunately, we here and, and certainly in many places across the country have um, hunger coalitions and and what have you. But that's not enough to support a family of four. No. You know, it can it can help. Um, and you know, in those instances, Kristen. And, and this is where we would, this is straightforward cognitive behavioral therapy is when we experience just that no job, no food or, you know, scarcity. And, you know, all of us, I think we're holding out till April 15th and then it was April 30th. And now we're thinking May 1st, it very likely could be April, 2021. Right. And, and so I, I, we want to the coping skills that I teach when, and all of us experience that, whether we're therapists or providers or not, we want to take that big, deep breath in. And we want to challenge our mind. It's not going to come natural to come to the present, you know, so we want to prepare or be aware of what we, steps we can take, you know, with threats in, ahead of us. But so much of the anxiety and fear is future focused with COVID. It's right. what if I, I lose my house? What if I get infected? What if my parents get infected and die? And so, you know, one of the coping skills, it's not going to take the anxiety away, but it will help um, manage it is we want to, I take my palm out and I take my other fingers and I press right in the middle of it is that I want to be right here right now to the extent that I can be present in this moment. And then I want to take one breath in of having compassion for myself that I'm feeling freaked out and worried and and upset about all of these things. And then I want to extend compassion for others because when we get fearful, we seek to control. And I can't even tell you, I mean, we live in a neighborhood where I've, I've only heard a horn beeped once, and that was with elk on the road. And now people are beeping, they're shouting out um, at, with people with other license plates. They're um, giving people what I call the moving madra, uh, shooting birds. Um, people are yelling in grocery stores. I've never seen it. I, I, people are fighting with their neighbors for breaking um, the, the six foot you know, separation. And so, it's getting, it, it, it's increasing agitation. So to the extent that we can breathe, to the extent that we can challenge ourselves to be present, to the extent that we can have compassion for ourselves and compassion for those who are struggling around us, those are all things that are going to help, you know, calm, you know, and, and ease. Nothing is going to take it away. And, and we Americans, we, we, we're a little spoiled. You know, we have a oh, headache, yeah. we take a Tylenol, right? right. We, we don't do well with uncertainty. Um, you know, limiting consumption. I, I don't know about you, but I'm always looking at that phone for the answer. And I know it's not going to come for a year, but I still, I still look, maybe it's coming, right? right? Oh, you know, right. And, and the paranoid things that we'll do. I mean, I've said this on another show. I 
got hives. I've never had hives in my life. They covered my entire body. So what do I do? And it was because I ate an egg that had, you know, that wasn't pasteurized and had some bacteria on it. <laughs> and it was horrible. But what do I do? COVID and hives. And of course, you're going to find something. Of it has course. nothing to do with it whatsoever. But I went down a rabbit hole of, oh my gosh, these are early signs that, da, 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 you know, so I just allowed myself to do that. And then I giggled about it later, even though I definitely went to the whole, who have I touched? Who have I infected? Oh my, you know, I, I did the mm -hmm. full gamut of, you know, of fear, but, um, with that reaction. Yeah. Was, yeah. And, and then went, okay. And I, and, you know, I, I think it's interesting too. And I, I know this from the other, you know, mental health professionals that are front lines with this too, is people are not behaving the way that they quote unquote normally would. And so being very forgiving and understanding of that while also not allowing yourself to be, you know, oh. bullied is, is challenging. I mean, I, I definitely have, uh, you know, I, I felt a, a few, quite a few people come at me with this heightened anxiety and all this pressure on me to do things for them because their way of managing what's happening was to become ultra productive. And that meant mm -hmm. roping me into their ultra productiveness when I was at a state of, I just want to take a nap and eat, you know, like, <laughs> right. leave, me, leave me alone, you know? Well, and, 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 you know, yeah. And being able to say, no, I love you, but you know what? No. And then in some cases say, stop calling me. Right. You're having something. Mm -hmm. I get it, but this is called a boundary and you need to mm -hmm. get way the hell on the other side and having to do that with people that I really love and knowing that mm -hmm. they're just freaking out, but I needed to protect myself. Absolutely. I, I use this phrase at least a several times a week in my own home where four of us are navigating isolation together. And I teach every single client that I talk to. And it's this phrase, I say, these are challenging times. None of us are the best version of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I need you. Mm -hmm. I need you. And with that, we pick and choose. We don't sweat the small stuff. Right. When someone slams a door, you're trying to do a family exercise class and one child runs out and slams the door. I can't do this. This is stupid. You know, you, right. you, you, you let them. And when they come back in and say, okay, I'm going to do it good enough. You say, well, great, let's continue on. And it's not some angelic I'm there. It's with intent and mindfulness that we choose that phrase of coping. And we choose that phrase of interacting that these are really challenging times. None of us are the best version of ourselves. And exactly. I need you. And I need you. It's hard to argue that one. And if you don't need them, you just say, these are challenging times and none of us are the best version of ourselves. Right. I'm, I'm going to excuse myself. Yeah. I'll give you an example. This was hilarious. We're doing yoga, which I tend to not really have liked yoga. It's just too slow for me, but right now, boy, do I need it. It's interesting. And so I'm doing outside yoga. Everybody's 12 feet apart and we decide to let the dogs we do it in the dog park. So we let the dogs be in there. And I take my oldest dog because he's basically going to be a hedge. He's not going to bother anybody. And then there's puppies running around and I don't care. Like I love dogs, but the puppies are like slamming, you know, they get riled up and they're slamming into the yoga teacher and they're slamming into other people. And I'm, and then my dog, I'm not telling anybody else's dogs what to do, but I'm telling my dog who's getting now verklempt over this, calm down. And somebody decides to get very irritated at me for telling my dog to lay down. And it was interesting because I, I got very calm. I know this person goes to DEF CON 1 over everything anyway. And they were, you know, this is fine. And just let the dogs be. Like they were telling me to relax <laughs> while they're screaming at me. Chill out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I looked right at them and I said, I hear what you're saying. And what I need you to do is take it down breathe, take it down many notches and let me do what I need to do. You don't need to worry about how I handle my dog. Mm -hmm. Just let it, it go. I'm not worried about the dogs. I'm sorry that my reaction is bothering you, but focus on having it not bother you. What a challenge. That's what yoga is all about. Mm -hmm. Letting go, breathing. And they, were, and they just looked shocked and then they turned their mm -hmm. head and I'm like, they're just lashing out at me because of their own internal stuff that they're holding in. And I was a target, but then I didn't allow myself to stay the target. So it was a good exercise. 
Well, and that, that, that is huge. And, you know, the other thing I challenge, and, and again, people, this is one of those things that people sometimes want to throw a shoe at my head when I say this, but <laughs> you know, we, this, this is not a sprint, you know, we yes. thought it was a sprint. It's the marathon. Yeah. And, and we have a choice of which shoes we want to put on during this marathon. We can put on those fancy shoes that we would wear to a, some event that start to cause our feet to go numb and pulse after about an hour, or we can put on our comfort cruisers. We all have our special comfort cruisers, right? right? And, and I say it's emotionally, it's the same way. We can put on an attitude that is uncomfortable, that is victimizing, that is blame shifting, you know, the, the, the shame, blame, judge, criticize game, or we can put on the comfy shoes. And what I challenge is to the extent that we are able to choose kindness, to choose love, to choose compassion, to understand that we are all in this together and we need each other. We need each other. And so it's not easy. It's more of a, of a, a accountability option, if you will. So when I'm feeling, when I walk in the house and I'm seeing a string of shoes and I feel like opening the door and whipping them out one at a time, I just say, I'm going to put on compassion. I'm going to put on compassion because that irritability is mine, you know, and I'm interpreting when we have all that cortisol buildup, we look for the closest moving targets. And that one day it was my kid's shoes, you know? And so it's just, and you laugh at yourself. You're like, okay, I don't know who that is. So I'm going to have compassion. I'm going to choose compassion. So I just challenge when we have that option of which attitude to put on or which attitude to grab for the day. If we can choose one of kindness, compassion, and joy, it's not that we're doing it for other people it feels good and it helps us be in the present and it helps us, you know, coming back to the first responders, you know, it's so important because when we're first responders, we're, we're the experts, right? Right. And so we're used to being the experts and, and therapists, they, they're kind of split in a class. There are those who are very comfortable in leaning out to get their support, their nurturing that they need. And there are others who are giving only, and they're not as comfortable with receiving. And I say right now, you know, for all of us, and especially for providers, we need to lean in and we need to lean on, meaning we need to have those one, two, if we're blessed, three people who we can lean into and lean on to nurture us that, wow, you know, I, I've not been a therapist during a global crisis before, and there really are some, some challenges in navigating this. And I need your support, you know, right. and then you get prayer or love or articles or, or meditations sent to you. Session absolutely who your therapist is that helps you be a therapist. I mean, abs- that's one absolutely. of the things I was asked this week was, you know, what can what can counselors do that are, you know, seeing more patients than they have ever during this and learning technology at the same time and some working from home from home and all the things that we've talked about, you know, what, what can they do this week to really support themselves? And the first thing I said was they can go to their own counseling session just for themselves. Well, and, 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 or, and, or peer supervision, because we have to remember that we have counselors, thousands of them, right? And now they're counselors, um, we are counselors in a global crisis, but we are also counselors who are people, meaning our counselors are going through their own family challenges, loss of a family member by death, not related to COVID, relationship challenges, um, school challenges with their three kids trying to homeschool. And, you know, really as therapists, if we can lean in and lean on each other, um, here in our town, one of our therapists put a um, a, a chain, okay, technologically compromised over here. Um, it's an email chain where we okay. just touch base and we share resources and we check in with each other. And it, there's a full spectrum of people who are not working at all um, because the dynamic it does not work for them to others who are, you know, are, are like myself, where my case has gone full, you know, online. And it's how can we help each other? And it really just, just even having that chain is supportive. So To the extent that we can lean in and lean on each other for that support, for that nurturing. And then the other thing, you know, what, this is a skill that was used after 9-11, you know, um, in Manhattan, when all of the therapists really were dealing with just the, the, the grotesqueness of the trauma here, our big trauma primarily is fear and uncertainty and loss, um, um, unpredictability, but a skill that is encouraged for some therapists is before you go home is to just jot down the things that are strongest on your mind. 
Mm -hmm. um, meaning a 21 year old who had COVID and is on a ventilator and is almost dead. I think, oh my God, the age of my kids. I know this kid. He's healthy and strong. Immediate threat, right? So, bu -bu 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 -bu, right. you know, so that's on my mind. And so I want to write it out so that I can give it a vehicle to release. So to decrease the likelihood that I would bring it home with me. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Ab oh my gosh. Oh, it's perfect. And one, Kristen, one that you and I do, I think really well. And I think that a lot of people forget about and that Frank King is just lovely and keeping me on my toes in this one is to remember that one of the best things for stress and release is laughter. Oh yeah. Just being able to laugh. Our, our big dog, you my Sadie, my big adopted dog. I was taking some items to a person in need and I came home and my kids said, we don't know what she did. She disappeared for a half an hour and she came back looking like a, a hippopotamus, hippopotamus. So she, she, she had eaten something, you know, instead you, you want that whole flight or flight of, oh my gosh, we got to take her to the vet right now. She's going to explode. And then just to be able to laugh at yourself that no, she probably got into the neighbor's dog food can and, you know, let's laugh at it and let's laugh right. with it. And, and truly, I don't know if you guys do this in your town, but our town started this 8 p.m. howling. And I kid you not, oh, that we go out of it. our houses at 8 p.m. and everybody howls. And it that howling is in support for the frontline first responders. Oh, I think I want to institute that here where I oh. live. That is amazing. I'll send you a link. One of the one of the individuals climbed up on the mountainside because we're located in the mountains and they recorded the howl of the valley. Oh. And it is the most goose bumping tear jerking things that I've experienced in this valley. And we do it every night. And so that's fun. Oh. My, my kids see me out there howling. My dogs look at me. They're like, oh my good Lordy, this quarantine's getting to her. But it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please send it's me a fun. link because I'd, like yeah. I'd like to say a uh, clinical psychologist is recommending that we do this so they don't look at me like I have three heads. That we yeah. go out and howl at our, yeah, at our neighbors. But it is funny <laughs> because you, and you know, you can't interact with, you can't, you know, go into your neighbor's house, but we howl and then we look at each other and we laugh and we howl again. And, you know, some people bring out trombones, but it, so laughter, you know, to the, you know, again, this is not a sprint. We're in a marathon. And oh, the other thing that we want to um, touch base on, Kristen, with, with first responders and with people in general, is that I caution um, all of my friends, family, and clients um, to be aware of, one, we have to establish new norms in this marathon, but I caution them to be aware of the new norms that they're establishing. So sometimes with first responders, with that intoxicating level of cortisol, um, the medication is alcohol or substances. Right. And, you know, we joke that, you know, you, you can look, I'm going to end up a chunk or a drunk, you know, all over Facebook, you can see those silly little memes, but right. it's not, it's not funny because if those are norms that we're developing during a time of crises, oh, there's yeah. a, there's a belief that they're going to go away when the crisis goes away. And it's and not that simple. Don't. They yeah. don't. The body becomes dependent. The psyche becomes dependent. So we just, yeah, I notice I've been eating more, even though I work from home, I'm still, that's a stress response for me. So I immediately ordered uh, a cleanse through this company standard process that I absolutely love. And I'm going to do, to do that. And someone had said to me, why would you put your body under that kind of stress of a cleanse during this time? And I said, because I'm giving it a gift. Well, absolutely. And you're doing something. And I absolutely recommend this you're creating structure exactly. and a routine. So the cleanse gives you 15 day, 30 day structure. Yep. And, and that structure, even every day you do the cleanse is something that you've done of value. It's something exactly. that you have control over. Yeah, exactly. It's instead of just, you know, it's a free for all at the fridge. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, Oh, okay. Wonderful. Thank you. I know you're packed. It's a Friday. It's uh, I've been doing dates on shows just so people know exactly where we're at in the <laughs> timeline. So today is the 24th of April. It is 1.30 Eastern in the afternoon and, um, and uh, really wanted to touch on, you know, our other additional first responders, which are our mental health professionals being called on more than they ever have been before. So thank you for doing what you do. And thank you to all of my listeners um, and the listeners of Meyer Clinic's podcast, because we're going to air this in both places. Um, thank you to all of you that are in this field doing the work that you do. Thank you, Kristen. Absolutely.
Thanks so much for listening to Mental Health News Radio. Our podcast can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, and hundreds of other podcast apps. Or you can visit our website at mentalhealthnewsradio.com. If you have a question or would like to be a guest, become a podcaster on our network, or join the amazing organizations that help keep us on the air, please email us at info at mhnrnetwork.com. Get ready for that special goodbye from our resident therapy dog, Miles, and a special thanks to Emily Sohn for letting us use her incredible song, Cordial, for our podcast music. Listen to the full song on SoundCloud at emily.sonne. Don't be surprised when I don't hate on you. After all we promised, we'd be cordial. Sometimes in you, I can fight it. Good boy.